praise God. Um, I'm just going to sh share a short word. And, you know, going back, <coughs> excuse me, going back to the verse that uh, Brendan opened the meeting with. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and ye not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. And, you know, the more I think about that verse, and it's a, one of my favorite verses when I became a Christian first. And I often wonder about it. Like we pray it, we say it, we read it. But do we believe it? You know, do we do we do do we come to Jesus and say, you know, Lord, here's everything. You know? I give it over to you now, into your hands, here it is. I'm leaving it there. I'm not going to fret about it or be concerned about it. That's it. Could we do that? You know, it's difficult to do. It's difficult to place your trust in someone you can't even see. But he has been so faithful to us. He's the one who has given his life for us that we can come and certainly put all our trust in his hands. You know, when you talk about nature, and I, I love reading books about nature and about different things, but on last uh, Thursday I shared about uh, beans. I asked them, did anybody grow beans here? And nobody, they, nobody put up their hand. I said, I don't grow them either. But I said, if you were to set beans and if you were to go out and watch as the beans grow, you would notice that, first of all, a little, little stem comes up out of the ground and two leaves on this stem. And the leaves are so delicate that were you to take them up and place them on a hard surface and put a little sheet of blotting paper on the leaves, the blotting paper would crush those leaves. And yet, those little leaves push their way up from inside beneath the ground, right out there, crack the earth as they're growing up. And they push up a clod of earth weighing over one pound in weight. No problem to them. They just have to get up. They have to break that side. They have to get up. And why do they do that? Why do them leaves, why, th that little stem, why does it grow up? Why do trees grow up? Why do plants grow up? Because every one of them knows that they have to get to the light. And I said to the ladies who were present, I said, if any of you gets a pot and you have it on, a flower on the window, which way does it grow? It grows towards the sun. It grows towards the light. And that's exactly what it is. Now, who tells this bean little plant to do that? It has to be God. There is no man sitting in a room with a button and he presses it. Now the bean has to grow. No, it's God that directs the bean leaf to the light. Because without the light, there is no life for the bean. No life. He has to grow towards the sun, S-U-N. And then, if we look at our own lives, we too need the light for life. We need the S-O-N, not the S-U-N, the S-O-N. It is to him we grow for life. It is to him we go for life. Without him, there is no life. He gave his for ours so that we would know life, a special kind of life, eternal life, whereby we can be set free from all things. Freedom can come to us. Free from sin, free from worry, free from anxiety. You know, that there is, it talks about healing in the word of God. And I will, read, I will read it soon uh, where it says oh, about healing and sicknesses, etc. But there is only one place there will be no sickness, no sin, no worry, no anxiety, and that's in heaven because it's a perfect place. Earth is an imperfect place. That's why so we have sicknesses and pains and worries and all of this sort of thing going on. 
and sin. You cannot separate one from the other. You cannot say there'll be no there'll be lots of healings and no and no sin. You cannot separate one from the other. This is an imperfect planet we live on. And it became imperfect when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Before that, it was perfect. And when we go to heaven, that's what God, Jesus said that God would send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to reveal these things in us so that we in turn could reveal them to others. And as Christ comes in the person of the Holy Spirit within us, we have something to look forward to. And that's the place that he has gone, Jesus has gone to prepare for us. And that place will be perfect. Just imagine. Total perfection. No sin there. No sickness. No worry. No anxiety. No fretting about anything. Just perfect peace in the presence of God. Hallelujah. 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 You know, I shared something many years ago here about an egg. I'm going to share it now. About an egg. Yeah, yeah, I love eggs. I eat eggs. I love eggs. Do you like eggs? Yeah. Easter eggs or, or hen eggs? You know, which some people rather Easter eggs, okay? I like hen eggs. But do you know how a chicken comes out of an egg? A lot of people don't, you know, ladies, some people that men don't know how a chicken comes out of an egg and how the chicken gets into the egg. It's all of God. You, you know, an egg, when a chicken is in the egg, it's like a battleship because the hen can turn the egg any way you want to and the chicken will not get disturbed inside in the egg. There are little strands. It's like, you know, you'll be holding down a building that you tie down. There are little strands that come from the shell right into the bitumen, the, 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 the white, the yolk of the, of the egg. And they hold it in place so that if the chicken is turned any way, no matter what way the hen rolls, no matter how many of the kids come and they disturb the eggs, it cannot shift the chicken within. And the chicken sits in a particular way in an egg. His bill is toward the wide end of the egg. And his back is toward the narrow end of the egg. And the reason for that is, the wider part of the egg, the shell in, at that side of the egg, is weaker than the shell at the other side. And while the little chick is growing inside of the egg, there's a little air chamber at the side that the bill is pointing towards. And that air chamber contains air for two days. Two days. And while the chick is growing within the egg, his bill is sitting in this little air chamber. Just imagine it. Just imagine how God ordained all of this. A little air chamber inside the shell of the egg. And the chicken's bill, grow, uh, as he grows, is sitting inside in that chamber. Just enough air for two days. And as the chicken begins to grow, and then he starts to breathe. And he continues to breathe. But then after two days of he breathing, the air inside the chamber goes. It's gone. There's no more air in there. So now the chicken, the little chicken, has to get out of the egg. So how does he do it? Well, God has arranged that on the bill of the chicken grows a little cone-shaped hard substance that has one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to break the shell that he is pointing towards the weaker side of the egg. So when the little chick wants breath, he wants air, he lunges forward towards the chamber, okay, but there's nothing in it. So then he lunges again, and the tip of his bill hits the shell and cracks it. And then he sucks air in. And because he knows now there's air out there, he wants to get out, so again he does it. And the shell opens, and he emerges. And when he emerges from the shell, this little cone-shaped hard thing on his bill falls off. 
It's of no more use. No more use. What a miracle. You know, we talk about miracles and we talk about healings, etc. Could a man ordain all that? Could man organize all that? Only God can do it. In uh, the word of God, in, in Matthew, it says that, that Jesus said, to, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who were sent to you, I would have gathered you, he said, like a hen gathers her brood, but you were not willing. You were not willing. How many times does the Lord come to us and he wants to gather us. He sees us fretting. He sees us worried. He sees us down. He sees us broken that we've already had about in the songs this morning. And he wants to gather us like a hen gathers her chickens. But we are not willing. Because we want to do things our own way. And fretting means getting angry, getting defensive, getting all upset over something. And God comes and he wants to gather us like chickens under his wings. You know, it, it talks in, in, the, in the word of God about God gathering, like the, 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 the hen gathering her brood. And the number seven is, is mentioned all over the Bible. It's mentioned about 700 times between the Old and New Testament, the number seven. And the number seven stands for, stands for completeness and perfection. And do you know that God has written the number seven into nature? Where? where the chicken is concerned. Because every, all eggs hatch in numbers of seven. A hen egg hatches in 21 days, three sevens. A duck egg hatches in 28 days, four sevens. A potato bug hatches in seven days, one seven. And there are lots of more in there. So God has written his word in his word, but he's also written it into nature. If we would only open our eyes and see. If we would only question why plants always grow towards the light. And I'm going to read from, for, from, for you now from Psalm 37. And in this there are, a num there are five things I want you to see. And that is if we do this and this and this and this. And then we will go to another Psalm and you'll see what God will do. And here in Psalm 37 it says... Do not fret because of evil. First line, do not fret because of evildoers. Not be envious of the workers of iniquity. What was happening and what was seen here by the psalmist was that people were looking at what was happening on the other side of the fence. Those who were rich and those who were well off, they lived their life in a different way and they seemed to be blessed. And the psalmist is coming. God is speaking through the psalmist. And he's saying, why are you worried about them? They're going to wither away like the grass. But you have eternal life. You're never going to die. Those who have Christ will never die. You will live forever. You will live forever. The, the, the wealthy and the... And the I'm not, don't get me wrong now. I'm not saying that every wealthy man is, is wicked. Or that every wealthy woman is wicked. Okay? But what he's talking about here is evildoers. Those who have turned their back on the Lord. And so here he is saying, it, as it says in the word, it is more difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. You know? It's what you're focused on. It's what you give yourself to. And that's what he's saying here. Do not be watching them. Just think about yourself. Focus on me. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green hearth. They shall wither away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. You know, last week I, read, I said a, 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 a scripture, James 4.17, which says, if you, knew, if you know something to be good and you don't do it, to you it is sin. To him it is sin, actually, it says. If you know something to be good and you don't do it, to him it is sin. Here it says to do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. In other words, live where you are. 
live on this earth and trust God to sustain you through his word. His faithfulness is food for you. His faithfulness is food for you. It is through him that you will be sustained. It is through him that you can live your life focused on him, not on other things. Focus on him. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, what that means, if you delight yourself in the Lord, if you draw close to God, then you will automatically know the desires of God in your life. And those are the desires that he's talking about that you will receive. Your desires will, God's desires will become your desires. The closer you get to God, the more time you spend with him, you will understand the desires of the plan that he and purpose he has for your life. And his desires will become your desires. And those you will get, you will receive from God's hand. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean out on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. Commit your way to the Lord. Commit your life into his hands. Talk to him. Ask him, Lord, what's your plan for my life? Lord, where are you leading me? Lord, am I on the right road, Lord? I give this road into your hands. Lord, I feel to go down this way. Is this the right way, path for me to take? Lord, I feel to, to do whatever work it is. Lord, is this what you've called me into? And do you want me, Lord, to step aside from it? Remember Nehemiah, when they were going rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, the, the, others, the others that were supposedly his friends called him, come down to us, Nehemiah. Come down to us and, and we'll go and help you. And Nehemiah knew their heart because it had been revealed to him by God. And he said, no, we have enough work here to do. Why should I go down there? I have enough work here to do. And he didn't go because they wanted to set a trap for him. So be careful. Commit your way to the Lord, no matter what it is, if you're going to school, whatever it is, give it into his hands. Give it into God's hands. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. The also there means that God gives us joys in this world. God gives us things to enjoy without sinning. And then trust also in him. So when you're enjoying yourself and you're behaving in a way that glorifies God and you're not sinning, then he says, rejoice also in God. And you're doing that as you live out the other. And the two come together. And it's all committing your way to God. Because when you commit your way into his hands, this automatically follows on that his desires will become your desires and that you will then live your life accordingly as it brings glory to God. And everything will just come together as one. There'll be no division. There'll be no wanting to go off this way and go that way because you will know from him the right direction to go. Sit down with the Lord. Have time with the Lord. Get close to the Lord. Open up the word. Read the word. See what God is speaking to in the word. Just because he speaks something to me doesn't automatically tell you that it's for you. He speaks to us as individuals, and we will see that in the next psalm we read. For evildoers shall be cut off. For those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. And that's talking about what's coming. You're living in this, on this earth here. This earth has been given to us where we live now. But we have a land further on, a place that the Lord is preparing for us. And that to us, then, this, that's our inheritance from God. It's our inheritance. We are co-heirs with Christ, the Word tells us. Co-heirs with Christ. 
So what God, Jesus gets from his Father, we are co-heirs with him. Therefore, we too shall receive that. As Jesus lives in heaven, so also will we, side by side with him, standing in his presence, talking to him, communicating with him, laughing with him. You know, I, I, I was here this morning and I was so overwhelmed with the presence of the Lord. And you know a thought that dropped into my mind and that was, unless Thursday evening God was smiling in heaven and the angels around him were, were, were rejoicing. I can imagine the laughter, you know, like, you know, if you were mine, my, like mine, you could think anything. But, you know, it, it's, uh, it's really like the joy of the Lord. What more, what greater ambition should each one of us have? Only that we bring joy to God. That should be our greatest ambition in the whole of life. As he gives us things in life to enjoy. That we will not forget him. That our also will be not also of him, as it says here, but it will be also of that. We'll rejoice also in that, having put him first. It should be our one ambition, and that is to glorify him. No matter what the cost to ourselves, that we will glorify God in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we speak in all that we preach, in all that we teach, no matter what it may be, that it would be to glorify and honor God. Now, could we go please to Psalm, 30, uh, Psalm 91? And you all know this, you all know this Psalm. Psalm 91. And there is so much in it. But I just want to grab hold again of a few things from it. And it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. In other words, he who trusts. He who does not fret. If you have that secret place, do you have a secret place? It may be your cupboard. It may be out in your car. It could be anywhere. That secret place where you just draw aside with him. Where there is no fretting. There is no worry. There is no anxiety. As you come in to him, you just leave all these things at the door. And you come in, you sit in his presence, and you take out your word, you do your study, you do your reading, whatever it is, and you worship him. You can worship God if you bring a list with you. There comes a time first where you must come and worship him. If it's all about you, that's not worshiping the Lord. Worshipping the Lord is coming to that secret place and just giving him your first few moments or whatever it is. That's how we pray. We pray as it says, A first, adoration. C, confession. T, thanksgiving. S, supplication. X, you pray as, you just think of that word X. The first is worship and adoration. You come into his presence. And do you know who taught me that? John. You first of all give glory to God. Secondly, confession. You confess your sin. Then you thank him. And last of all, you ask him for you what you want. That secret place. When you enter it first, it has to be worship. It has to be adoration of him. Coming alongside him in that place that he has set aside for you and him to meet. It could be sitting at the, the table. It could be in the corner of a room. It could be anywhere. But it's that secret place. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You shall be under his protection. When you abide under the shadow of someone, you have to keep so close to them. If you're walking with somebody and you want to get under their shadow, you have to, get, you, you, near have, you have to attach yourself to them. You've got to get so close to them to be under their shadow. Otherwise, it's impossible. You've got to get so close to God. 
just so close get in there with him. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. He is a refuge to you and a fortress, a place you can feel secure when you enter into that place. It's a place of security. No demon can enter there in this secret place. No devil can enter there. It's that place just of you and him worshipping, praising, confessing, thanking, and then you give me your list when all before is done. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. The fowler comes and he sets traps. He sets traps. I knew a man that's, when I was a young kid, he used to set traps for birds, not to kill them or anything, but he would put them in cages and he would feed them and look after them so, so well. And they would be beautiful singers. Oh, wow. The house would be filled with song, whistling birds. Oh, wow. It used to be amazing. And here he says, the fowler, the fowler sets traps. The fowler can set traps. That's talking about your enemy, the devil. He sets traps. He can set traps of any kind and he can change them. He changes them so that you will not get used to them and you'll know the trap. He changes them around. He shall cover you with his feathers. The chicken, remember the hen? We talked about the brood. She gathers her chicks. Where does she put them? Under her wings. That's where she puts them. There was a great fire in, uh, in a place in America not too many years ago. And it was on the mountain. And the firemen came to put out the fire. And they searched along the, up along the, the hill the fire where the place had been burned. And they came across just this clump on the side of the hill and when they examined it they could see that it had been something like feathers and they just it was just totally burned totally scorched just a, a lump of feathers on the side of the burned feathers and one of them just pushed it aside like that and beneath it out popped four little chicks alive the mother had given her life for those chicks and that's what Jesus was saying in Luke, he said, in Matthew, he was saying, would I have not gathered you as the mother hen gathers her brood, but you were not willing. You were not willing. What a statement could that be said of us, that we were not willing when he was calling us aside, sometime when we were fretting and worried, and he's saying, come hither with me. Come and sit with me. Read the word. Read the word. Take it out. Read the word. Worship. Praise. And from the perilous pestilence he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. His truth. When you live by the truth of the gospel, you need to have no fear of anything. You have no fear of anything. You won't have to lie. You won't have to do false things. You won't have to cheat. If you live by the word, it'll keep you safe. You won't have to be looking over your shoulder or anything. The word of God is the word of God. It's the truth. You won't be worried about anyone knocking at the door or inquiring or anything. If you live by the truth, you're free. You're free. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste in noon. No matter how things come against you, night, day, strong, or easy, no matter how they come against you, you're under his protection. He's protecting you. Now, that's not to say that you won't get sick. If you read the Bible, you'll see right through it all the wonderful people of God that got sick, had pains, etc. If you look at uh, any of the 
people, the, the great preachers of the world, and you will see how many of them died, their wives died, their families got sick, etc., etc. And that happens. But then there are those that we can point to that were healed. It's God's will, not mine. I know he can do it, that's why I pray. But the end result is his. And we won't know the answer for that until we come before him and stand in his presence and ask him, why, Lord? Why, Lord? A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. You can be in a stadium with ten thousand people inside this, and something can strike. We'll say an earthquake, just giving you an example, okay? And you can be the one person that knows the Lord standing in the midst and you have peace. Because you know, in life or in death, you're safe. You're the blessed person that stands in the midst of that. You're protected, whether you live or you die. If you live, you have Christ in your life. If you die, you go to be with him. And there's rejoicing in heaven. So you can't lose. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. In other words, you will not experience what they go through. You will see with your eyes how they wither away, as it spoke of in the other verses. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you. Now, just notice there that he says no evil. He doesn't say no affliction. Evil he's talking about. Spiritual sickness, which is evil. Affliction is sickness. Affliction is what affects your body and your mind. No evil shall come near your dwelling, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you. I always thought we only had one angel looking after us, you know. Sometimes when I go out on the road, I pray to the Lord that he sends an army to look after me because I need it. And, uh, you know, but here it says he's angels. So God, it's amazing. You know, one uh, um, teacher of the word said that we won't know how many angels God sends to protect us until we get to heaven and see the numbers of angels that were sent out with his authority to keep us safe, to keep evil away from us, to protect us. We never know what sicknesses God has protected us from. We never know how many accidents on the road God has protected us from. We never know what he has protected us from. That is why we should have that secret place and that we should praise him and worship him. Talk with him and ask him. Commit your way to him to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample under foot in other words evil comes against you no matter how it comes as strong as a lion as, and as strong as a cobra whichever one you, you see is the strongest doesn't matter he's protecting you and keeping you because now this is not the people talking to God this is God talking back to the people and he's saying because he in other words this fellow that has come into the secret place right because he has chosen, he has set his love upon me. Because he has chosen to love me. Therefore, this is God speaking, I will deliver him. I will take him out of the enemy's hands. 
because he has chosen to sit in this place. He has chosen me above all else. This is what God is saying. I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. In other words, he will hide you from the enemy. He will hide you from the enemy. Remember Jesus when he walked the earth and they tried to arrest him, but they couldn't find him? He was right in their midst. They couldn't find him. If you read the Gospels, you'll see that in it. God hid him. He blinded their eyes from seeing him. And that's what happens. That's what he's saying here. He will hide you from the enemy. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. That's God's promise to you. You will call upon him. You will pray to him and he will answer you. He will answer your prayer. Now to know the answer, you need to sit with him in the secret place. You cannot just grab hold of something out of the sky and say, this is God's answer to me. You have to sit with him and let him reveal it to you from his heart what he wants to speak to you, no matter how tough or how whatever it may be. He will reveal to you in the secret place. I will be with him in trouble. So we can get into trouble and he will be with us. I will be with him in trouble, he says. I will deliver him and honor him. Wow. Just imagine. God says, I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. In other words, you can trust God to keep you and to direct your life in such a way that you know salvation. You know you're saved. If you are a child of God, you know you're saved. You know where you're going. And he will give you peace and joy. You are the one that in the midst of the storm, no matter what rages around you, the whole world may be falling down around you. People come to me and they say, be careful of this, be careful of that. You know, I met someone during the week, they said, this one wants to bring this type of religion or this wants to bring it. And, you know, I don't take any notice. I just said, my God is in charge. I just rest in him. I just take my guidance from him. I just sit with him and I just get my revelation from him. Whatever happens around me is fine. Do I worry? Yes, I worry. Do I fret? Yes, I do, and I have to confess it after. But when I get into that secret place with him and just let him, it's him and I, I can see the hand of God in many things as I saw here on last Thursday night when God came and answered our prayers. That's the word my word tells me and I've just read it. He will answer your prayer when you call upon him. How long did it take? Years, years as we walked around these buildings and prayed. Years. God answers prayer. Don't be trying to rush God. Don't try and hurry him on. It'll happen in his time. However long it takes, it's his time, not ours. Be faithful to him. Enter into that secret place. Praise him. Confess your sin. Thank him for what he is about to do in your life. And then bring in your request to him. And let God do it in his time. As you wait patiently, the hardest thing to do is to wait. But to wait with patience is a lot harder. That's a longer wait. Let's pray. Lord God. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word to us, Lord. 
Thank you for your love, Lord. Thank you for your care, Lord. Thank you for the joy, Lord, of just knowing you so well, Lord, that you reveal yourself to us, Lord. I thank you for the answer prayer, Lord, that we have seen, Lord, with our own eyes. Help us to understand your ways, Lord. Help us to commit our ways to you, Lord. Lord, reveal yourself to us, Lord Jesus. Reveal yourself to us, Lord. Let us see your plan and purpose for our lives, Lord. Let it be such, Lord, that you are our God, Lord, and we are your servants, Lord. We are your children, Lord. Gather us under your wings, Lord, like the hen with her brood, Lord. Let us be a willing people, Lord, not unwilling, Lord. But let us run to you at all times, Lord. Let us sit with you, Lord. Be partakers, Lord, of what you have for us, Lord. Teach us, Lord. Guide us, lead us, Lord. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your care to us. In Jesus' name, amen.